Welcome to our Voices from the Field series, focusing on the State Department of Education and Parent Center Partnerships. I am Melanie Reese. I'm the Director of Cadre, and with me is Noella. Hi, I'm Noella Bernal, and I am the Associate Director and Internal Evaluator for Cadre. We're really excited about this series. Cadre has long been committed to promoting and fostering productive relationships between state agencies and parent centers including uh, work we've done in the past with um, intensive TA work groups in the area. Uh, we've put on webinars, showcased promising partnership activities, had presentations at our natural, uh, national symposia, and hosted a selection of continuum practices on our website. Our belief in collaboration is shared by today's guest, whom Noella will introduce. Yes, we're so thankful to be joined today by Kathy and uh, Lori and Chris from the Arizona Department of Education and Raising Special Kids. And I will let each of them introduce themselves. Chris, if you'd like to go first. Sure, thank you, Noella. My name is uh, Christopher Tiffany. I'm the Executive Director at Raising Special Kids, and that is uh, Arizona's Parent Training and Information Center. Kathy? I'm Kathy Gray Mangerson, the Education Systems Administrator for Raising Special Kids. And I'm Lori Bird. I'm the Chief of Dispute Resolution for the Arizona Department of Education, and I have the privilege of working with both Chris and Kathy. Great. Go ahead and get started some questions. Um, so maybe we start first with, with you telling us a little bit about your organization, uh, the scope of work and structure, um, and we'll, we'll start with the Raising Special Kids. Sure. Our organization, Raising Special Kids, is a nonprofit organization. We've been around for 42 years this year. Uh, started as a grassroots effort in 1979 in Arizona. Became the uh, OSEP funded Parent Training and Information Center in 1985. And so we've done this work for quite some time. And the scope of our work is to provide parents, family members, youth and young adults with disabilities, uh, anyone acting in the role of parent with the information, training, and support they need in order to effectively advocate uh, for their child with uh, school systems and systems of care outside of the, the education system. So the structure of our organization is a comprehensive family resource center designed by parents and led by parents to empower families with, with the resources, information, training, and support they need to uh, promote positive outcomes in their in their kids' educational outcomes. Lori, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, about the, the structure of, of how you see your work. So we are actually, I work for the Arizona Department of Education. The Arizona Department of Education, uh, by federal law, as you know, has general supervisory responsibility to make sure that school districts are following the law. And as part of that, we have a unit of dispute resolution which manages and oversees state administrative complaints, due process, uh, and parent procedural safeguards. We also offer mediation and we offer facilitation in conjunction with our, our sister unit at ADE, which is Exceptional Student Services. And so both Exceptional Student Services and Dispute Resolution partner with Raising Special Kids in a variety of of ways so that not only are we serving school districts, because remember, a, a state department of ed uh, has many responsibilities to its, its district stakeholders, but we partner with Raising Special Kids to help us fulfill some of our responsibilities to our very important parent stakeholders. And so within the last year and a half, which is well, to two years, which is when I've been with dispute resolution, we've really grown our collaboration with raising special kids so that everyone has access to the same quality information and the same understanding of what's happening in the special education world so that we increase the benefit for students who are involved in the special education system. Thank you. Thanks, Lori and Chris. Can you uh, describe a little bit more about the relationship between the Arizona Department of Education and raising special kids? Well, we we have um, both a formal and informal relationship with the Arizona Department of Education. So um, we've had a longstanding partnership. And as, as Lori kind of described, 
you know, in the last last couple of years, it has really uh, strengthened and, and grown. Um, but some of those formal formal partnerships have been in place for several years, um, and we work very closely with the Exceptional Student Services uh, Department to provide things like uh, professional development for uh, in-service and pre-service uh, educators. Um, so that's something that we do as kind of a formal uh, agreement with Exceptional Student Services. But the informal partnership is really where I think our work shines, um, and especially it shined in the era of COVID. Uh, when COVID-19 hit, um, you know, that was one of the first calls, and I can't remember if it was me who made it or if it was Alyssa, who is the Director for Exceptional Student Services, uh, made it. But we then started meeting, um, I think, bi-weekly um, to make sure that uh, accurate information from uh, the Department of Education and also from that was coming out of the governor's office was distributed not only to um, districts but also to families and we uh, in addition to that um, I know that we were a regular uh, participant in the weekly director's calls Kathy was a, was a part of that and maybe she can share a little bit more actually I'll stop talking Kathy I'd like you to share a little bit more on on um, what that looked like um, sure. With COVID, and I'm brand new in my position as of January 2020, so my responsibility is now to teach our staff about special ed, and then COVID hit in March. So, and we had many, many executive orders from the governor that um, ADE needed to tell the schools this is what this means, this is how you apply this. And so they held weekly check-in meetings and basic, and they gave workshops on so many topics I can't tell you about, but I was on every single one of those because I needed to hear what they were telling the special ed directors so that I could make sure that our staff understood it so then they could share the information with parents. So one of the benefits with COVID was that I think that the parents in Arizona who have called us are better informed and understood mm -hmm. what was coming about. But um, Lori, in another life has worked exclusively with parents and really understands what they're about, what's important to them. And she was able to take that understanding. And anytime I called or emailed, she got right back to me and said, this is how this is interpreted. Make sure that parents understand this. And so she would give me the correct information. I could give it to staff who then gave it to parents. So, and I relied on her often because we had interesting things in Arizona, like one of our biggest things in August is the insurance company in our state that insures most of the districts was now having districts have parents sign waivers because they wanted coverage for COVID. So it was, I think a lot of our stuff this year was not, didn't have anything to do with IDA. But because schools were seeing all this information and having all these questions, uh, ADE was addressing the, those topics for schools, and I was able to take advantage of all the webinars that they put on. So that really helped. And we also um, we also provided uh, information for in those meetings. Um, for the districts on what we were hearing from parents, um, kind of a top five issues uh, type of a thing. And I believe we did that at least once, maybe twice over the last year. Uh, we also, Lori and I and, and Angela, who's over program monitoring, would uh, would appear at numerous events. And we were almost like the three musketeers because we would share <laughs> And I really felt that my job was to share with Lori what we were hearing for parents. Mm -hmm. She needed to know what parents were saying, what their concerns were. But we spent a lot of time working on a lot of different projects, things that none of us have ever done before. But it was we did a three-part series with not only ADE, but with the Arizona Center for Disability Law, strictly for parents. And every time that we've asked anyone from ADE to come on our Facebook, Lori was on Facebook um, a month ago talking about high school graduation, they have bent over backward to send a representative to talk about whatever that subject is. I kind of think of it as building a bridge, right? Because sometimes there's a disconnect. Um, parents don't always know the district perspective. Districts don't always know the parent perspective. 
And by us talking frequently and collaborating and, and knowing what's going on out there in the real world, um, because especially at the department, you know, we're kind of sometimes in the, the, the castle on the hill, so to speak. We've got a lot of, of institutional knowledge, but we don't really always know what's going on in the real world. And what we may think is important to what, parent, what we're hearing actually isn't what parents are really struggling with. And so to be able to build that bridge between parents and districts and between parents and the department was an incredibly valuable experience. And even outside of COVID, I think that kind of communication will better serve students because at the heart of it all, we all want the same thing and we want students to succeed. And particularly in our realm, students with with disabilities and so to be able to create those relationships that creates a bridge so that we have a shared understanding is incredibly valuable certainly keeping students at the center is the work right and chris you mentioned that the relationship has really strengthened over the last several years um, would you mind talking a little bit about that evolution and how the relationship has become stronger the evolution of the of the collaboration and the partnership getting stronger i think is really just a function of relation personal relationships uh, i've known Alyssa trollinger who is the director of the exceptional student services for several years i've been with the raising special kids since 2011 uh, i'm sorry since 2010 so for about 11 years and she's been at the department, I believe, for longer than that, but we had worked together in a professional capacity, uh, and then ultimately both kind of ending up in our roles that we currently serve, I think was you know, certainly a benefit of, of collaboration. We've had a, a more formal collaboration with the Department of Education since about 2013. And so that was really important because we had some documentation and, and some things in writing. So when there was some leadership change in our organization and then leadership change within the department, that existing kind of formal collaboration was really helpful to um, keep us talking at all times. So I think that is that was important for our, for us, for both of us to get to this point. And I've heard the name Lori Bird for, for many, many years, uh, but had not had the pleasure of actually getting to meet her until she became a part of the, the Arizona Department of Education. So um, I think that was just a, a real good, a good fit also. Um, and the relationship between Kathy and Lori, I think, has done wonders in, in partnership or in line with my relationship with Alyssa, I think, has, has really helped us get to where we are now. Thank you. I respect both Chris and Kathy's knowledge and their perspective and their experiences. And we're not coming from a place of conflict necessarily, which is actually sometimes where our stakeholders are coming from. But we're not coming from a place of conflict. We're coming from a how can we make this work together? How can we understand each other's perspectives? How can we problem solve through some things? And I, I do just want to throw out something that actually isn't really directly educationally related that came out of this relationship, which when Raising Special Kids was hearing from their parents that students were online, but they didn't have any support because it was a longstanding, I, ha I hesitate to use the word prohibition because that sounds so formal, but that habilitation or respite or behavior support wasn't available during the school day. And so Raising Special Kids really started working with the uh, DDD and access and having those ongoing conversations about why can't you provide, the kids are at home, they need this support to engage in online learning. And we were able to come alongside the foundation that they made in that area, present a joint kind of front to access as our uh, Medicare, Medicaid provider, uh, Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System. And so we were really able to come alongside of raising special kids on a project that all of our stakeholders could agree on. And uh, now DDD or access is able to provide support to students who are learning in their homes during school hours. And to my knowledge, we are the only state that was able through our collaboration to make that happen. And so this is the importance of collaboration between our, our agencies 
um, in that we can really provide that benefit to students. We helped a lot of students there, I, I think, I hope. And so, and that was foundational work that was started with RSK that we were able to come alongside and support. And so that was, it was really kind of exciting to be able to make that happen because nobody said we could do it. <laughs> well, I have to, I just have to piggyback off of that, Lori. You know, that's, that's, I think one of our proudest, proudest moments as an organization was just being involved in that conversation. You know, certainly we did bring the need of families to our state agencies, both the Department of Education, our Division of Developmental Disabilities. And I just, I commend both those two agencies for, you know, getting in a room with, with Access, our Medicaid um, provider, who did an amazing job too, and really working together. Now, we, at that point, we stepped away from the conversation. Uh, we were just happy to help get it started. But, you know, those three entities really uh, worked hard to make it possible for long-term care eligible students uh, to be able to be supported in their distance learning efforts so that parents could work uh, at home in the next room, that parents did not have to be right next to their child facilitating their education. If I had to point out a silver lining, uh, that certainly is, is one of the shining ones. And then, uh, Lori, what you said about, you know, coming from a, coming from a place of collaboration, we believe at Raising Special Kids that you know, no one goes into this work to do wrong by children or families. We believe that people have good intentions. They might be bound by regulations or they might be bound by, you know, even maybe their own uh, prejudices. Um, however, because we're starting from a place of good intent, we believe that families and schools and, and um, teachers can work through issues. And that's, so that philosophy really permeates throughout our whole organization. Certainly, there absolutely is a reason why due process and the complaint system exist. So we do provide information on that, but starting from a place of trying to better understand, uh, assuming positive intent is, is where we really try to live. I love the framing of that, assuming positive intent and then the collaboration piece. Worth preaching. Melanie? I was thinking about the idea of being a bridge. Um, that everybody has their own their own distinct role and, and functions they serve, but at the same time we need to be able to connect to the other. Really well said. So what do you attribute the collaborative culture to? Uh, you, you talked about the importance of access, you know, being able to be part of the conversation, respect, you know, starting from a place of good intent and, and joint problem solving. What values do you share in common? with each other, even though you have different functions? Well, I think the first value we share is something we mentioned earlier, which is students first. So you have school districts and you have parents that need to work together for the benefit of the student. So if you always put the student at the forefront, I mean, I often say to both parents and school districts when they call in for some technical assistance, you can never go wrong by doing the right thing for the student. And even if you don't know the exact legal citation to tag that onto, you won't go wrong if you simply do the right thing that's in the interest of the, the student. And, and so I think starting from that place of, we all are voices for students. Districts may be speaking for educators, parents may be speaking for their student, but we're all very student focused. And I think coming from that place uh, allows us to have really difficult conversations because there's a lot of disagreement that can arise between districts and, and parents in how to best serve the student. But if, as Chris said, we assume good intent that everyone wants to act in the best interest of the student. You know, sometimes I say we have problems and. You know, the only reason we don't have a solution is because we just haven't thought of it yet. I think just coming from that student first place, but also having people like Kathy and Chris who are just so knowledgeable um, and, and also realistic. I mean, we all have to be realistic. We, we can have utopian ideals, but we also have to live in the real world and work with the resources that we have. You know, the other thing that I often tell schools when they start to get fired up and upset is, you have to understand that, that parents only have the tools in their tool belt that they have. 
And until they reach out to someone like raising special kids, maybe the only tool in their tool belt is a hammer. And so in collaboration with raising special kids, we can give those parents those advocacy tools so that districts then become less frustrated, relationships are enhanced between parents in the district and students are served uh, students are just served better that way. And I think the other thing that we assumed and we certainly told parents was that everybody involved in this process in COVID is doing the very best they can. And there were days, we start school in August, and there were days in August and September when things were changing by the hour. That something Lori told me at 8 a.m. didn't apply anymore at noon. <laughs> And so all of us were trying to keep on top of it. And every single person from the superintendent of the school district down to every parent and every student was doing the best they could with the constantly changing circumstances. Yeah, and I would, I would add, um, you know, our mission at Raising Special Kids is strengthening families and systems of care to improve outcomes for children with disabilities. And so, though we are a parent center and our primary focus is families and parents, ultimately it's to better outcomes for, for students with disabilities, right? Ultimately, it's for employment, further education, independent living. Um, so, we really try not to lose sight of that. That's a value that we hold very, very near and dear. And so, just piggybacking off of what Lori was saying, we have that shared focus of of student outcomes, um, although our our real primary focus is the, the parent and family piece. Thank you. And speaking of parents, are, are there any other benefits of this collaboration for parents and to that end, public education agencies and the SEA? Well, I think, you know, we, we mentioned before, and a large public agency like the Arizona Department of Ed can't have its ear to the ground in every single place. And without knowing, we can guess based on what our educators and our district stakeholders are telling us, but we don't always have as much access to what parents are experiencing. I can get direct phone calls, but I don't get the volume that raising special kids gets. And so the value to the agency is also being able to be proactive instead of reactive, being able to see where things are going sideways because maybe we need to put out some more guidance. And, and in fact, we've done that in response to things that we've heard uh, from parents. You know, Kathy mentioned the waiver. Um, even though masks don't fall under the IDEA, we, uh, we're keeping AD and ESS in particular has a website devoted to issues related to the COVID-19 and the ongoing virtual learning, if that was appropriate. And so we were able to not just incorporate one side of the equation in those questions, but we were able to also address some parent concerns in the form of guidance to districts that we wouldn't probably have been aware of, to be quite honest, because we're not that close to those situations. And so the information and the, the back and forth contact is really invaluable for the agency to fulfill its mission um, and to do its work. And that, you know, the, the key word that you mentioned, I think, uh, Lori, was access. Having access to what we're hearing, but also our, our families and our staff having access to the accurate authoritative information coming out of the Department of Education, I think has been a, just a huge benefit. And then I know that Kathy will, will add on to that. And I also wanted to say part of the benefit, part of the collaboration is several times that Arizona Department of Education has had racing special kids come on to their monthly meetings, if you will, for special ed directors. And we've talked about what are we hearing now from parents? What are the top five concerns? 
And I've been telling special ed directors since August, it depends what month you ask me about. <laughs> Every month, the questions have changed. And the questions that we got in August, we don't get anymore, but now we're getting different questions in April. Um, so we've had the opportunity informally to come on to their presentations and talk about raising special kids services and what we're hearing. And then formally, we are doing, uh, we've created a workshop, as Chris mentioned briefly earlier, that we give to, spe to special ed staff in districts and charters and to pre-service teachers and really talk about the parent perspective and what is going on with the parents. And I think that that has benefited a, a number of special ed personnel in the state this last year to really understand where parents might be coming from. Well, and one of the resources that we do use, and I think it's even part of a formal contract, Chris, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that we often use or ask raising special kids. I don't want to make it sound like we're using you guys yeah. so. um, to translate things because the world of special education, as we all know, is very complicated. And sometimes we really feel like, okay, we're giving this information to special education directors who know all the acronyms and speak the, the, the language of special education, but a parent doesn't always speak that language and it's a foreign universe to them. And so one of the things, uh, for example, the graduation guidance, the guidance is exactly the same when you look at it but one is in a parent friendly version and Kathy and, and her staff, I know worked very, very hard on that. And then we looked at it and I went, okay, yes, the, what you said in parent friendly way is exactly what we said in educator speak. Uh, even though we, we try not to be convoluted and complicated, you, you can't help it. And so having a translator is really important so that everyone has that access to the same information in a way that they can digest, understand, and use it. And so we collaborate in that way as well. We did some other, um, I know there was some other translations that you did, Chris. Yeah. Uh, I think the compensatory okay. services was another area where we have companion documents. One targeted for educators, one targeted for parents, not that both stakeholders can't use both documents, but they're, they're tweaked in, in such a way that they're more meaningful and accessible to a particular stakeholder group. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, and we've done, we've performed that type of activity for, for a long, long time with the Department of Education. Um, and that activity has lasted uh, many administrations. And, you know, strangely enough, it's, it's actually not part of our, our formal contract. Oh. We do that because we, uh, we do that. Well, I mean, it's definitely part of our partnership and our collaboration. Um, but we do that because uh, we feel it's important. And I know that we put out some information on parent training as a related service that, you know, Lori looked over and reviewed. And that was something that, you know, in the absence of providers being able to help students through their distance learning, which I have to say that really only accounted for um, a, a kind of a smaller subset population of students that were eligible for long-term care. You know, helping families understand that the parent training as a related service absolutely could be used in this type of a situation to help families facilitate the distance education of their children. And Go these ahead. were things that came up during COVID, boy, we need a document about compensatory education. We need this, we need that. Um, and, we, and we were able to say to ADE, would you take a minute, would you look at this? Would you make sure it's legally correct and then we'll do the parent-friendly language? And so those weren't necessarily things that were planned, but they were very important. And so we we're able to uh, spin quickly and get that type of thing done because that's what the parents really needed. You know, I commend the department and, and really all of our state agencies for pivoting quickly. I know we've talked a lot about this, but things changed so quickly. Um, and it was just it was great to have great to have a strong partner that was on the same page that we were that was supportive of what we were doing and working together to in our both of our respective pivots to do right by families and kids and there were a couple of situations that that staff brought up to me and anytime i thought something didn't sound right 
and I had documentation to prove that what the parent was telling us was accurate, I would contact Lori. And there were several situations where an individual special ed director had not interpreted what ADE said correctly, and we had to fix that situation. And Lori then got uh, program support and monitoring involved and they talked to that special ed director and, and explained it to the way that the special ed director needed it so that ultimately the student would not be negatively affected by that. So it really uh, even went beyond the scope of her work, but she was the contract person. I'm like, Lori, this doesn't make any sense. Is this what you were trying to say? And Lori came back, no, that's not at all what we were saying. Let's see if we can't get somebody to talk to the special ed director. And, and again, because the information was changing so rapidly, trying to stay on top of it, whether you were the special ed director or the parent was difficult for everyone. And it was just a slight tweak but Lori got involved she got program monitoring involved they talked to the special ed director and the, and then we followed up with the parent and the situation was fixed so while we were trying to do everything system-wide sometimes there were individual situations that had to be addressed as well sounds like that relationship is really important in order for you to be nimble and to, mm -hmm. to address the, the ongoing crisis and the changes that are happening so quickly and to, to switch gears if you need to, um, slow things down if you have to. So it, it really is commendable that you have that communication uh, open that you can you can say, hey, this is working or hey, this is not working. Um, this is an issue you might not have thought about that that really is fostered by your, your working relationship. So that's, that's really commendable. Um, so you've talked about several things that, uh, that, that you're proud of in terms of your working together. You've, you've mentioned some joint trainings, the guidance documents. Um, could you could you talk a little bit about some other examples that you have of of how you work together to meet the needs of parents and districts and uh, and children with disabilities? I would say nothing was off the table. And if some, if one or the other, either ADE or Raising Special Kids, had an idea or something that we thought would benefit our target markets, if you will, it was proposed to the other person. So, for example, um, in the summer of 2020, it was brought to our attention that, hey, would you like to participate in this three-part series for parents? Each part had a different emphasis. And we're like, absolutely. Hey, do you think ADE, we, ADE might be involved? Well, let's ask them. And they're, of course. So I, I just think that any opportunity there was to share that it was, let's ask the other party. And I don't think that it, that we ever turned each other down for the idea. Maybe we had to negotiate on the date or the time <laughs> or something like that. But the idea was sure. If you think that this is helpful to your stakeholders, we'll absolutely participate and vice versa. Well, I think it's important to emphasize, I mean, you know, if, if people watching this are thinking, well, how can we, we do this within our own uh, systems? You do have to have the right people, and by that I mean with the right mindset. Um, you know, there are no Voldemorts here. There are no no people who are obstructionists who are coming from a place of of controlling or evil intent. And so, I think I can't stress enough how much respect I have for both Chris and Kathy. How how much knowledge they have, um, how sincere and genuine they are. I mean, let's not sugarcoat this. Kathy and I did not always agree, but we could always have a discussion and we could always come to a place where we could go, yeah, I see that, or yeah, I see that. And then at least agree on something. And, and unfortunately, sometimes we could both go, you know, that's not right, but that's the law, and so we're stuck with it. <laughs> and and so it, it's got to come. You've got to work and build on those relationships, and they have to start from a place of of uh, a trust and a knowledge that everybody's competent at what they're, and more than competent in this case, at what they're doing. And so it's also got to be intentional. You have to have that intentional continuous contact. Kathy and I haven't been in contact as much. Things have kind of leveled out, but I know on a moment's notice, I can shoot an email or pick up the phone and say, Kathy, 
Kathy, I need to know what you're hearing about graduation. It's going to become a, a bigger issue and I want to get out ahead of it. And Kathy right away uh, was responsive to that. And we put together both a tune-up for SPED directors on graduation and a tune-up for parents on, on high school graduation. And so I think it's ongoing communication, respect integrity, meaning there's no hidden agendas and an intentionality that, that makes this work. You said that beautifully, Lori. I don't know that I could say it any better, um, but you did say one thing, you know, for, for people that might be viewing this, that might be looking to create a more collaborative relationship, you know, some of the things that that we are that we do together that are that are real intentional uh, the parent center has a representative on the state advisory panel in arizona it's not a dedicated seat but we do have representation on the state advisory panel we also have representation on our state's icc which is part b part c um, but we work uh, intentionally with the department of education around um, the family involvement survey around indicator eight. Um, so those those are some things that um, where there's a real natural kind of um, crossover between priorities, especially for you know for states that, that might where the where there might be a challenged relationship. There's there's those activities that can open the door to start to to build a, a stronger relationship. And we have we have great respect for for Lori and her work, and you know that's only strengthened over the two years that we've gotten to know her. And you know I have a standing meeting with Alyssa, who is over Exceptional Student Services every month. We take a take an hour to talk about you know how things are going, what are our priorities, uh, what's on the horizon. So provides an opportunity for us to know that um, we're going to be, the state's going to be setting uh, targets for their SPP APR and their, their summer next year, right? So we're going to be involved in that as a stakeholder group. So um, those are just some of the, I think, natural places where PTIs and SEAs can can begin to work together if, if they're not. And Chris mentioned the, the CEP, the State Education Agency Advisory Panel. But for example, we have another representative who sits on the Arizona Community of Practice for Transition Committee, on the core committee for that. So we're at ADE as a representative as well on that. I sit on the Early Childhood Inclusion Committee for the Early Childhood Division of ADE and the things they do. So that's a way that also the PTI can be involved is some of the different committees, organizations within ADE where we're represented and we bring that parent voice. Can you talk a little bit about the partnership grant? I know, um, maybe explain what that is and, and how it functions. You might be referring to our, our contract with the Arizona Department of Education, which kind of lays out some, some key areas of, uh, of work under a scope of work, which includes um, some of the indicator eight work that we were talking about, um, pre-service and in-service training. And Kathy, I think what, what Melanie might be referring to is the partnering with parents in the IEP process, which is a part of that contract as mm -hmm. well. Do you want to, Kathy, do you want to talk more about that kind of curriculum and how we, we use that? You bet. Uh, the workshop is called Engaging Parents in the IEP Process. And we have a person on staff who is responsible, if you will, to do the marketing to the districts and the marketing to our uh, community colleges and our four-year universities in the state of Arizona and encouraging the professors as well as the special ed directors to have us come in uh, via Zoom and do this workshop. And not only does a staff member uh, do the workshop, we also have about 300 trained volunteers all over the state. So depending on what group we're talking to, then what we call a parent leader, someone who's been trained, comes with us. And so I talk about, in my part of the workshop, I talk about the Raising Special Kids Services. Um, I ask them questions about how do you get parents involved? How do you make them uh, special? That type of thing. I give them a little bit of information and then the parent leader talks about their journey through school. 
about their child, how that has worked, what is happening, uh, what were some of the great things that school did. And then we have an opportunity for them to ask us questions. And they ask me questions about raising special kids services. They ask the parent leader questions about their experience. But what the comments I get every single workshop we do this and we um, did it with one with the largest district in the state this year we trained almost every special ed uh, person in their entire district and then we worked with a number of uh, community colleges and four-year universities to give it to their special ed pre-service teachers as well but after every single workshop we get comments that say I thank you for sharing the parent perspective. I never thought about it that way. Now I have some ideas and suggestions the next time I work with some of my parents that I will try with them to see that it works. So it's really an opportunity to give them from what might be going on with the parent, what might be happening in their life, why might they not be the best partner at an IEP meeting, and gives them ideas and suggestions and strategies to use when when that relationship between the school and the parent is not as great as it could be. Um, and so it, I think it's very important work because it gets to the actual teacher. That's who attends. The special ed teacher that might be struggling with those types of relationships or with those parents. And it, they walk away with a different perspective and ideas and suggestions to use maybe the next time. I think it's a very powerful training. Thank you for sharing that. So we know that turnover across the nation is an issue that a lot of agencies face. What sort of mechanisms do you all have in place to, um, to deal with turnover and any challenges that arise from that? So just to clarify the question, are you talking about mm -hmm. turnover within raising special kids or like teacher shortage type thing? So either organization, either Arizona Department of Ed or raising special kids. Well, I'll, I'll speak for our organization. We have been very, very fortunate to not have had much turnover, especially within the last two years. I attribute that to our culture and our transparency, especially when COVID came on. We started meeting with all of our staff every week and then set up um, also additional team meetings for staff that have like jobs. We have done our absolute best as a nonprofit organization to provide a living wage uh, to our staff, um, knowing that resources are always limited. Um, when parents become a staff member at Raising Special Kids, we um, do our very best to support them, not only with the training that they need to be able to do this job, but also with the flexibility they need as a parent of a child with a disability. Um, so that's something that I, I think is not unique to raising special kids. I would imagine that, that many parent centers and CPRCs are, you know, operate with a similar philosophy. But we have been very fortunate in uh, turnover that we have not really had much. And I mean, I can, in dispute resolution, my predecessor, I think, had been there for probably 15 years or more. And we're also fortunate that our state director, Alyssa Trollinger, although she's been the state director, I want to say for four or five years, so don't hold me to that, but she's been with the agency at least 15 years in various roles. Uh, but I think if you're talking about, so how do you make sure that there's continuity? Well, in Arizona, superintendents of public instruction can change every four years. We hope that isn't the case sometimes. Sometimes we do hope that's the case, so I'm not going to make a political statement here. Um, but I think you're talking about continuity, and I, and I really think that that comes from creating a culture. We can't guarantee that the same people are going to be in the same positions, but what we can work towards is a culture that gets passed on, be that through oral tradition or written tradition, um, that there's a culture that's passed on, that these are valuable alliances, these are valuable relationships, and whomever steps into a vacated position is, ha, is the expectation is that you will carry on this, this collaboration. So is there a formal mechanism for that? No, I mean, 
you know, you work for a state agency, you know what what that entails in terms of pay, in terms of the trade-offs for benefits versus, you know, maybe direct compensation. But I think it's more about building a culture because you have to plan for the vacancies. Because they're going to happen. And I'm not sure there is a mechanism by because pay isn't always it either. Uh, it's important, <laughs> but that isn't always the reason either. So I think that you create just an expectation that becomes so embedded in the fabric of the, the two entities that it doesn't matter who steps into that role. Um, and then you plan for the transition, you know, you, you make sure that that your hiring process is such that you're hiring people that value the same things that made the collaboration successful. I would, I would agree with that. Uh, thank you, Lori, for bringing that back around. Um, you know, another piece of our, of our kind of formal partnership is an annual, um, annually raising special kids will uh, meet with the entire Exceptional Student Services Department at one of their staff meetings. So that mechanism is built in for, you know, the entire staff to hear and see the collaboration at work, in addition to some of the other things that I mentioned. And I wanted to add, when Chris talked about when we closed our Phoenix office and everyone moved home, and I'm not based out of that office, I'm based remotely, so I've always worked at home. And it was great to be able to get on a platform like this and finally be able to see everybody and hear everyone. <laughs> but what the weekly meetings did was someone could see me and hear me because sometimes everyone now understands what it's like to work at your home office. And sometimes there's a great deal of isolation. Uh, and so connecting weekly was critical for us. But the other thing, and I keep telling Chris that maybe he has an ability to to uh, predict the future or he should buy a uh, lottery ticket. But literally in January in 2020, he said, all right, I'm going to create this position and I am going to have you teach the staff about special education. And then it turned out with COVID when we needed to have weekly meetings, I was able to, for 15 minutes to do a little spot to talk about what is the latest thing with special ed. And I think having those weekly meetings and then giving the staff the information that week about COVID in whatever area it might have been really helped them say, I feel much better knowledgeable about what's going on in these various issues because we also have a healthcare per a person who focused on healthcare, et cetera, like that. So those are some ideas maybe for PTIs. Maybe they can look at the way they're structured and those kinds of things. But I think that the weekly meeting has really been critical for everybody to say, you see me, you hear me, I matter, I'm an equal part of this particular organization. And I think that that's helped with turnover as well. And Kathy, can I just piggyback on that and also to Chris? Look, I, I've been my other life, so to speak, although I've done several things legally, was I was a parent side attorney for 15 years. And I will tell you that in the beginning of those 15 years, uh, when I got a client that said, well, raising special kids told me, I went, oh no. <laughs> Um, because the information wasn't always accurate. And I think part of the trust relationship is that raising special kids now is very accurate and they value making sure that even though their volunteers and paid staff are coming out of, of the parent world, that they give good information now. And that's only been increasing. Whereas maybe 12 years ago, I wouldn't have told a parent, you know what, go talk to raising special kids. I have no hesitation now when I get a phone call and it's more than more assistance than I can provide out of dispute resolution because, you know, I am constrained by some things. I can't be an advocate for the parent and I, um, we don't have, you know, the IEP webinars or the, the Facebook lives. But there's a trust now that's been built through Chris, you know, that probably just culminated in hiring Kathy. That was genius, by the way, Chris. Um, that I can trust that the knowledge that, that they're imparting to parents 
is accurate. And, and to be quite candid, before this particular team, that wasn't always the case. Um, and I know that was because there was some in-house stuff and, you know, ADE had the, the pins, the parent information, but, but really being able to trust that the knowledge that's being disseminated by them is absolutely spot on legally means that I don't hesitate when I say, you know what, I know exactly who can help you. And in fact, we've made direct referrals now to raising special kids. We've done things like a parent says, I don't understand this state complaint report. You know, why? Why did you find what you found? I've referred at least two parents to raising special kids and say, you know what? Have them go over their report with you so that you better understand why things came out the way they did. Um, and I had no hesitation at all in doing that because the the knowledge base that Raising Special Kids has now is phenomenal. So a shout out to you guys. You've done a, the, the, a great job. You've helped us with that, Lori. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Thank you so much for the wealth of information that you shared. Uh, we will often hear from uh, both state departments and parents that the relationship with the other agency isn't quite where they'd like it to be. Uh, that, 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 that there is some uh, lack of trust, that there is some um, hesitancy to, to refer. So, you know, having, having come through that to this, this place where you are, what advice do you have for others who want to improve their collaboration with, their, with, with the other? Well, I have one very simple equation that I learned a long time ago, that trust equals behavior over time. And for, for us and for our staff, we're a professional organization. We, we have standards of professional conduct. Our, our staff know that, um, you know, when they're out representing uh, the parent center, raising special kids, that, that that's the way that, that we behave. You know, I think that's um, something that is, is certainly not new to raising special kids, but something that I think has built the trust over the last 12 years that Lori describes. We do our, our very best to, to support parents, um, and we find ourselves in situations with IEP teams because Raising Special Kids does support parents in IEP meetings. It's our highest level of support, um, but, you know, that's a, that's a highly charged situation, helping uh, family advocate, um, not advocating on behalf of families, but uh, being there to support the family and help them better advocate for their child. And so we have, you know, a, a very defined process for doing that. Uh, you know, the family goes through training, we provide individual consultation, and then, you know, many of, not many, some of those end up with, with IEP meeting attendance. And that's, that's where I think our work shines the most, both families and professionals you know, get to see our staff modeling appropriate dispute resolution uh, behaviors in meetings, seeking to understand and assuming positive intent and ultimately problem solving uh, in the best interest of the child. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's what, that's what came to the top of my mind when you, when you asked. And my advice for PTIs would be is to have a select group. I don't know if that's one or several people, but usually a lot of us who come into this really understand our child's situation well, but we don't understand every child situation well. And so I know when I got into this work 13 years ago, I've had the opportunity to take advantage of going to uh, different workshops, participating in anything that ADE has offered that's been free to get knowledge for me to try to understand what special ed directors might be up against or what they're required to do and to understand that side of it. Because I pretty much understood what was going on with the parents, but I really needed more knowledge to feel comfortable of what what may be some of their requirements and that kind of thing. And if the if your uh, SEA offers any kind of free workshops or anything you can take advantage of, I would recommend that because just sitting in on workshops with special ed directors and hearing the questions that they ask and the situations that they bring up. Uh, let me to understand, wow, didn't realize that was an issue for them. Okay, have to think about that the next time. So 
uh, I would say that might be the way to do it. And I would also tell you that in our the workshops that we offer, the IEP workshops, all of the others, we get many professionals who come to those and listen to those. Even though they're geared for parents, the professional wants to learn that information. So whatever you have to do to go across the aisle, so to speak, to understand where that uh, those other people might be coming from and to get that knowledge is going to be helpful for you to understand. Lori had said, I, I didn't like all the answers she gave me this year, <laughs> but I understand <laughs> that this is Lori's job and she has to interpret it the way that it is interpreted and then we have to understand it and then explain it to parents. But because of that respect of what her position is, then I know that that's the information we have to give forward and then I just hold on to my personal opinion or she and I might share it publicly, <laughs> but not everybody else hears those types of things. So learn what you can about the other side, so to speak. And I'm uniquely unqualified to give advice to parent training and information centers. However, I think one of the things that Raising Special Kids and Kathy in particular does well is they're willing to be honest with their parents. And so they might say, look, I know this is what you think is right and this is what you want to do, but that isn't what you can do. Now, maybe there's a different way. Maybe there's a creative solution to accomplish your goal. But the reality is sometimes parents have misconceptions and a parent information center, I think, has a responsibility to tell a parent that and not just go along for the ride of, or, or get on the bus or the, the anger train with them or the outrage train but arm them with the correct information and to tell them when they're wrong. And, and because we have to tell SPED directors when they're wrong, <laughs> me or ESS or Program Sport Monitoring or whoever. So uh, I think a willingness to be honest with your targeted stakeholder group not only builds your credibility, but also is a service to students because you're not spinning your wheels trying to do something that's that's simply not going to work in the way you think it should work. I mean, I'm a big believer in outside of the box solutions. And, and Kathy and I have talked about, well, the loss of this, and you can't really take it head on. But hey, maybe you could do this. And being willing to be honest about that with your stakeholder group, I think is important. So I think honesty is, is a big part of what a parent uh, training or information network should do. And like I said, I'm uniquely unqualified to speak to what makes those organizations successful because I haven't worked in one nor have I run one. But I do think that that piece is important or it's been important in the work that we've been doing together over the last couple of years. Thank you so much. And, and thank, thank you all um, for, for sharing your valuable nuggets of information and, and learnings through the years so that other people can help improve their systems. Before we sign off, are there any last last words that you want to share? Any last bits of, of uh, information you want to make sure that people walk out with? No, just you know, thank you for having us. You know, last words of wisdom. I I just say keep trying. You know, if you if you don't have the the relationship or collaboration that you want, it does take time. And just trust equals behavior over time. So just keep keep trying. Keep showing up to those. Those uh, state advisory panel meetings keep providing uh, appropriate input. Keep saying yes to, you know, committee uh, participation if you have the capacity to do that. Don't give up. And form the relationships where you can. It's um, perfect in this situation where it's a top down, but sometimes it's not always that case. So if you can form those relationships with different parts of your SEA, then maybe that time it will go bottom up, or at least it will be most effective in those particular situations. So I think what Chris said is perfect. Just keep persisting, keep trying, try a different way, do a different type of project, and maybe that'll start and uh, the ball will roll from there. And I couldn't have said it better than the two of them said it. Be intentional in your relationship building. It is It, it benefits students and that's the work that we all do. None of us got into this work to be millionaire, millionaires. We got into it uh, to make a difference and to benefit students. And you have to do that through intentional relationship building and, and solution creation. So I guess it's it's not going to happen unless you're intentional.
Thank you so much. Uh, we are extraordinarily grateful for your generosity of your, of your knowledge and your time. And on behalf of Cadre and the field at large, uh, thank you for, for all of your information and, and for sharing. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.